Um, it's so great to have you with us this evening. All right, so as participants continue to join, we'll go ahead and jump in. Hello, everyone. I'm Julia, a bookseller at Politics and Prose. We're live with Jocelyn C. Zuckerman and Marion Nessel discussing Planet Palm, how palm oil ended up in everything and endangered the world. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, please use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To enable captions, click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of the screen. And we do want to sincerely thank all of you out there for joining us. We are very grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce this incredible book. Over the past few decades, palm oil has seeped into every corner of our lives. Worldwide, palm oil production has nearly doubled in just the last decade. Oil palm plantations now cover an area nearly the size of New Zealand, and some form of the commodity lurks in half the products on U.S. grocery shelves. But the palm oil revolution has been built on stolen land and slave labor. It swept away cultures and so devastated the landscapes of Southeast Asia that iconic animals now teeter on the brink of extinction. Fires lit to clear the way for plantations spew carbon emissions to rival those of industrialized nations. James Beard award-winning journalist Jocelyn C. Zuckerman spent years traveling the globe from Liberia to Indonesia, India to Brazil, reporting on the human and environmental impacts of this poorly understood plant. The result is Planet Palm, a riveting account blending history, science, politics, and food as seen through the people whose lives have been upended by this hidden ingredient. And moderating this evening is NYU professor of nutrition, food studies, and public health, Marion Nessel, whose latest book, Let's Ask Marion, What You Need to Know About the Politics of Food, Nutrition, and Health, is available now from University of California Press. Let's Ask Marion is a savvy and insightful question and answer collection that showcases the expertise of food politics powerhouse Marion Nessel in exchanges with environmental advocate Carrie Truman. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Jocelyn C. Zuckerman and Marion Nessel. Thank you both. So do I take over from here at this point? Um, I am just absolutely delighted to be doing this. Um, I found out about uh, Jocelyn's book because it was sent, the manuscript was sent to me for a blurb, uh, an endorsement for the back cover, and I wrote one. So I'll read you what I said from the back cover. Um, I'm a nutritionist, and so I've always been interested in palm oil because it's extremely rich in beta carotene and, you know, it's a source of vitamin A, but it's also very high in saturated fat. So I've always thought of palm oil as just another best to avoid food ingredient for its high level of saturated fat, but I can never look at it the same way again after reading Planet Palm. Now I understand that oil palms represent Present the darkest underside of late stage capitalism. This is an ugly story, compellingly told it needs to be read. And I was interested to see that practically everybody else who wrote, who wrote a blurb said exactly the same thing. You've got to read this book. So I'm going to start out uh, by asking the obvious first questions that everybody always asks about books. Um, the what's palm oil and why did you decide to write about it? Thanks, Marion, and thank you so much for that blurb. I think I told you when I um, emailed you thanking you that your phrase, um, the darkest underside of late stage capitalism was, I, I just love that. That's, I think you <laughs> absolutely love that. Anyway, so palm oil is um, the most used vegetable oil in the world, and it comes from the oil palm plant, which um, looks like a coconut palm, it's got these big fronds, but um, instead of coconuts under there, there are these, these big bunches, they're about you know, probably two feet in diameter, these brown spiky bunches that have all these little um, 
sort of bright reddish orange fruits in them about the size of a date or like a, a smushed plum. And from that, you get um, um, palm oil, which is the orange stuff from the flesh of the fruit. And then there's a white kernel inside where you get um, palm kernel oil. So I, um, back in, I think it was 2014, traveled to Liberia um, to write a, um, an article, report an article about land grabs, which was the phenomenon, um, as people may remember, um, after the food and fuel crisis in, in 2008, um, of agribusiness, um, sovereign wealth funds, land poor countries going into places like Ethiopia and Madagascar, where there were big swaths of fertile land, maybe not great governance, um, and buying up or renting out these huge, huge swaths, as I said, of fertile land to grow crops. Um, so that was a story that I went to report on for the magazine on Earth. And I got down there in Liberia and um, was traveling around and went to one part, it was a, about an eight hour drive south from the capital of Monrovia in a place called Sino County. And they had just raised the tropical rainforest. I mean, it was just dirt as far as you could see. There's a picture in the book. Um, and it was to plant this crop oil palm. And then there, I visited another part of the country where, where they had planted oil palm about um, two years earlier. So there were sort of these young um, trees. And I just, I didn't know anything about oil palm. I mean, as you know, I'd, I'd worked at Gourmet Magazine at, at, for 12 years and I'd written about agriculture and nutrition um, and, but I had like some vague notion about Girl Scouts and orangutans from something many years ago. Anyway, so I just, um, I interviewed workers there who worked on the plantations. They sort of told really horrible stories. I interviewed a lot of villagers who said that they came in and they sort of pushed us off our land. They knocked down our grave sites, they polluted our water. Um, so it was, a, it was a very grim scene and I got back to New York and I thought, you know, what's up with this palm oil and oil, it's, it's the oil palm plant that produces palm oil. Um, so I just started researching it and then found out that, you know, the industry was already well underway in Southeast Asia. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to find out sort of why didn't I know anything about it? How was it possible that it was in all of these things and I knew nothing about it and what were the implications for the environment, for global health, for human rights? Um, so yeah, several years later, here we are. <laughs> well, it's the several years later part that fascinates me because um, you know one of the things that's just that I was just struck by was the scope of this book, international, the enormous amounts of travel, the number of people that you met, the people that you interviewed. How did you go about doing it? How did you decide where to go? And did you have any idea how complicated this was going to be when you started out? <laughs> I mean, I was, I was finding my way the whole time. And it was really hard, as you said, because I, you know, I was sort of sussing out the situation, but I would get emails from, so I guess I started by um, contacting some NGOs. There's an NGO called Green that you might be familiar with. Um, and I spoke with people at Friends of the Earth and Global Witness, um, Rainforest Action Network. And I just heard stories, you know, they were like, oh, you should go report on the situation in Cameroon. You should go report on the situation in Peru, in Sierra Leone, I mean, aside from the obvious suspects, um, Indonesia and Malaysia, it was just everywhere. And, the, and they were very similar stories to what I had seen in Liberia. People saying that their land had been stolen, that their rivers were polluted. Um, so it, it was hard. I was, I was running in a million different directions. Part of what I did, I guess, was um, try to get magazine assignments. So I was trying to sort of figure out different ways into this that I could get basically a magazine to um, fund me to go do the reporting. So I read something about um, how helmeted, hor helmeted hornbills were being poached in, um, in Indonesia, in Sumatra. And I thought, oh, I can pitch this story to Audubon and I can go there and report about, I mean, I knew that it was linked to the oil palm industry. So I did that. I also pitched a story to Vogue because I had found out that palm, palm, mainly palm kernel oil is in a lot of makeup and cosmetics. Mm -hmm. So I did that piece for Vogue. I did um, a piece with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists on, um, so in Indonesia, in um, the World Bank funded uh, and supported um, schemes that in entailed a lot of planting of oil palm plantations and knocking down the tropical rainforest. 
and ICIJ was doing this series on sort of World Bank funded projects that had maybe not turned out so well. So I pitched that story to them. Um, so yeah, it was sort of um, just going and doing this reporting. And then in the meantime, reading a bunch of um, obscure books about um, 17th, 18th century Nigeria and, and learning about the history and then trying to, what I was trying to do um, was find like one character for whom I could tell this whole story. And that was, you know, I, part of me felt like I need to move to Jakarta and just be there on the ground or just go to one place and trace this. But I felt like this is such a global um, phenomenon that I wanted to, I wanted to show the scope of it. So um, anyway, all of which is to say there was, there was really no rhyme or reason. I was sort of finding my way as I went through it. Well, it was a, it was a really complicated way because, you know, what I was, I was struck by a lot of things, but one of the things I was struck by was the range of issues. Um, you know, I put this book right in the same category as Sidney Mintz's Sweetness and Power, where Sidney Mintz had used sugar as a way to examine the Industrial Revolution, the role of slavery, the role of, of, of um, ingredients in international food trade. I mean, just anything that you could think of, um, sugar touched on. And that book is sort of considered foundational in food studies. I teach in a department of food studies, you know, so I'm very interested in this. And I was kind of left breathless by the number of issues that you touched on, the health issues. You know, is palm oil good, bad, or indifferent for you? The labor issues, the environmental mental issues, the political corruption, child labor, slavery, uh, cultural issues, what it does to the animals that are there. I mean, just go on and on and on about that. Did any of them surprise you? I mean, you, were you expecting that? It all surprised me. And yeah, thank you for, um, for giving me an excuse for why it took so long. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't know about a, a lot of these things. Um, I didn't know about sort of the biodiversity impacts. I knew nothing about peatlands and the and the situation with carbon emissions when you you know when you um, burn, drain that land and then burn it for plantations. Um, I was really astonished to find out that the the industry was growing so much in Central America, in Guatemala and Honduras, and that it was la on land that had been owned by Chiquita. Um, <laughs> The labor issues were, you know, crazy. Um, I think I think part of it is, yeah, the, I thought if I don't know any of this stuff and like I, I presume to be a person who knows about sort of the global south and trade issues and food issues, then most people must not know about this stuff. So well, um, don't you think it's because people don't want to know about these things or because they're kept secret or how come we didn't know about these things? I think it's both. I think part of it is like, oh, well, that's on the other side of the world. Um, and as I said, in Liberia, um, I had to, from, from Monrovia, I had to drive eight hours on like really horrible roads to get to this place. A lot of my reporting in Indonesia until long, long um, drives into the middle of nowhere. So a lot of this happens in really remote areas, um, which again, I think is partly why the industry is able to, to get away with so much of what it gets away with. Yeah, sort of out of sight, out of mind. You don't see this. All right, you don't take a spoonful of palm oil, right? It's it's processed and it's it's in all these things, but not in a way that you're actually going to see every yeah, day. So why don't you talk about that? What's it in? Um, it's in kind of everything. I mean, as I, I think I mentioned, well, makeup, personal hair care, uh, personal products, personal care products, um, any sort of sort of baked good that you're going to find on the in the grocery store or cookies, like an Entenmann's cake of some sort, ice cream, um, instant noodles. It's like 20% of instant noodles. They cook it in palm oil before, so that you can just put it in water. Um, baby formula. And again, this is like, so it's not this, it's not the orange oil that I talked about earlier. And it's not the white palm kernel oil. It's these two things that have then been processed into all sorts of different ingredients um, that can go under all sorts of different names as well. So you might think, well, I'm gonna avoid palm oil and look at all these labels, but you could see all these different words. Um, PKO for palm kernel oil, vitamin A palmitate, stearic acid, <laughs> sulfate. I mean, there really are something like 200 different names that a, a form of palm oil or palm kernel oil could be called on a label. 
So it's gone through a lot of processing by the time it reaches you. And, you know, it's not anything that's sort of recognizable. I mean, sugar is in a lot of things, but we also will take it out and spoon and see it. But rarely, you know, maybe if you're cooking West African food or if you're of um, African um, ancestry, you might be cooking that stuff. But I think most of us rarely would be cooking with palm oil. Yeah, we just don't see it. You know, one of the great ironies about it for me is that palm oil became extremely popular in the United States when um, we were fighting against trans fats. Um, you know, trans fats are a, a particular kind of saturated fat that's created when hydrogen was bubbled through solid oil, salad oil. And the food industry loved it because it had a thickness that gave um, baked goods, particularly just exactly the right texture, the filling in Oreo cookies, for example, was very high in, in trans fat. And when everybody realized that trans fats weren't good for heart disease, there was a quick run to try to find a substitute and palm oil became a substitute um, where because its degree of saturation can be adjusted by um, and its thickness at room temperature can be adjusted by fiddling around with it. So that's sort of um, you know, I mean, we're responsible for that in some way. And th that was kind of uh, surprising to me and thinking, oh, dear, everything has a consequence. These are an unanticipated consequence of what happened with getting rid of trans fats. Um, you know, I, when I first read the book, I read it in manuscript form and the manuscript didn't have the illustrations in it. And I, I pushed really hard to try to get a copy of the book before this. And I'm really glad I did because the illustrations are absolutely shocking. Um, they are astonishing. And there were some that just blew me away. The map of Liberia showing the palm oil plantations and the areas in West Africa where um, that were departure points for slavery was just an astonishing thing to see. Um, the the X-ray photographs of, was it orangutans with bullet holes in their heads? 16 bullet holes, the pictures of children working on this, and then the astonishing last photograph, and I wish there were some way I could show this, of that piece of art that was done in one of the African countries showing those the, essentially the slaves that were working on palm oil plantations. If you have some way of showing that, that would be great. I mean, I thought just astounding illustrations. Where did you get them? Yeah, you can't see it very well. Well, you can see people's arms up. It's and then the palm oil on the palm fruit on top. But where did you get them? How did you find these things? I got this is a really interesting story. So I read um, it's probably about so my third chapter is about William Lever, who's the guy. He was a um, British guy in Victorian England who started producing soap and then margarine, and he wanted to secure his own supply of palm oil to make these things. Lever um, Brothers. Everybody knows Lever Brothers. He founded what became Unilever, which is still the, the biggest um, uh, buyer of palm oil in the world. Anyway, so he wanted to secure a, a supply of palm oil and palm kernel oil. He didn't want to deal with middlemen. He also uh, was a racist, frankly, and said, oh, that I don't really trust those African workers. I need to go down there and show them how it's really done. So he, right after um, King Leopold was out of the Belgian Congo, they gave, land, they gave five concessions to William Lieber. He said, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm a humanist. I'll give them education. I'll build them beautiful housing and give them health care and sort of, and it was almost sort of to make up for the horrible things that, um, that King Leopold had done in the Belgian Congo. Um, so Lever went down there, no such thing. I mean, there was a, a little bit of, um, they did build some housing, but it was basically um, slave labor and they conscripted these men from villages and brought them in to work on these plantations to produce the palm oil. Um, anyway, there was a, a town there called Lusanga. It was the place where the oil palm groves were the densest. So that's where he started his production. His plan was then to build plantations in all these other places as well. But he started in Lusanga got down there, immediately um, renamed it Leverville, of course. Um, anyway, this, this photo of the artwork was taken um, in Lusanga or was created by artists from Lusanga 
So about two years ago, I read about a, um, an exhibit at the Sculpture Center in Queens that was, there were these sculptures made out of chocolate by artists in the, um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I looked into it, it involves a, um, a Dutch artist named Renzo Martins who had made this film called Enjoy Poverty um, in 2008 about sort of all about the global system, capitalism and global south. And um, so he went down there to this village and started working with people the, on the original lever plantation. Um, they brought in some, some local artists from Kinshasa and they started this whole thing where they were making sculptures and then exporting them out, out to the outside world in order to bring capital back to this place that had been so abused for all these years, for a century. So that's a sculpture by one of these artists in this place that was once called Lieberville. Now it's back to Lusanga. And, what, and they're using the money from the sculptures to, they've knocked down the old oil palm plantations and they're sort of building an agroforestry system so they, they can feed their families and make some money. Oh, it's, a, it's an astonishing story of, as I said, the dark side of capitalism. Um, there, uh, uh, when you were doing this, you write in the book about some really kind of dicey experiences that you got into. Um, I, you know, were you ever feeling like you were in any kind of personal danger? A couple times I was. So one night um, I was in Sumatra and I was with a, um, an Indonesian photographer, a guy in his forties. And we were, so these plantations just go on for miles and miles and it's a monoculture, it all looks the same. So you invariably get lost when, when you're driving around these places. So we were in this plantation and we were trying to find um, a particular person to talk to we were driving around and around and then we realized that the sun was starting to go down we were miles from the the exit of this thing from the town where we were staying um so we somehow found this chief of a. it's amazing people live inside these concessions they're sort of little village because they've just built them everywhere um we found the chief of this village and he said we could sleep on his floor so i was there with me my fixer and this photographer the fixer is also a, a guy from sumatra and we were in this little house, um, it was very nice. They made us some food. I think they, was, they were instant noodles, um, probably with a lot of palm oil in them. But at a certain point, the photographer saw that one of the guys from the, um, the national police was out on this little patio in front with his, nut, with his um, gun perched next to his chair. And I just thought, you know, whatever. I, but the photographer was freaking out. I mean, he was, he, you could see he was terrified he was like, uh, they're going to confiscate my camera, you know, they're going to throw us in prison. He, and he would know, I mean, this guy was from Jakarta. And I, so just sort of seeing him, I was like, oh, I guess I'm in more danger than <laughs> that was, that was one instance. The other time is when I was in um, Guatemala and Honduras, both times I have to admit, and I'm, I travel a lot, you know, I'm normally very sort of, oh, it'll, everything will be fine. I was really scared, partly because in both of those countries, the, the uh, palm oil trade is all bound up in the drug trade. So there's a lot of um, drug money being laundered through oil palm plantations. Oh, you need to say a little bit more about that. So <laughs> Explain. I was in, um, in a little town in, near Sayache in Guatemala where I got to report because this palm oil company, it's, it's um, pools had overflowed and completely um, polluted this river. They said there were, there were just hundreds of thousands of dead fish for miles and miles. Um, and I was staying at, at a little hotel along the lake and it was one morning at breakfast and there were two guys at the next table with kind of chunky jewelry and water. They looked very, they looked like they were out of the movie traffic. They looked like very coked up and scary. And you just don't know, you know, you don't know, am I just being completely paranoid or do they know that I'm here to report on the palm oil company, you know, that they're laundering the drug money through. And then I, and then I was walking, there were sort of docks between the, um, like the eating area and the rooms. And the, the lock in my room was like a little wooden thing that just went down. So I was like, if anybody wants to just slam through this and come in and kill me, they could do that very easily. Um, and I was walking along the dock and I swear I passed this man, he had like a rain jacket over his arm. And I thought that's a, that's a big automatic weapon that's under his arm with his, um, again, you know, it's when you're in that kind of state, you don't know if you're being just completely paranoid, but, but I know that, you know, there had been a lot of killings around that area. In fact, one of the guys 
who had organized the villagers after the, um, this river had been polluted, um, had been killed. So, you know, th there's a lot of violence around there. Um, I, was, I was pretty terrified and I was really scared in Honduras too, because it's just, there's a lot of, a lot of guns around. And, and again, it's all wrapped up um, in the drug industry, so. And how does the, how does it work? For, for laundering it through? Um, well, part of it is also you can, they put um, air strips like you, in, the, in the rainforest, they, they cut out, they can put roads through there and, and roads through the plantations. And then also, I guess, you, you know, you, you, you buy land and then you can launder your money through those, those purchases. No, no, I mean, and, and then what the people, what are people eating in this area? You know, I'm a nutritionist. I'm always interested in what people are eating. Um, you know, they're growing palm oil, but what are they doing about food? Well, it's, yeah, I, this, I didn't, this didn't make it into the book, but when I was in Guatemala city, I actually met with a woman. She wasn't a nutritionist, but she had done a study on how diets had changed in these communities um, before the palm oil industry came in and after. And it was, it was terrible, as you can imagine. I mean, they used to grow their own food and they ate, I guess, corn, maize, beans, um, whatever other local crops they would eat. And now they were having to buy things, um, you know, processed foods mostly. She also said, and, a, and another woman in Guatemala said, you know, they, they said, the industry says they're bringing development, but um, mostly what's what, what people are buying is liquor, liquor, liquor at the end of like the, I guess the palm oil workers would get paid every two weeks or something. She's or at the end of the week or at the end of the month, um, everybody's in the cantinas just buying liquor. So, and I also, there was also a study in, um, done in Indonesia by C4 Center for International Forestry. I'm not sure. It's like a, a forestry presentation that had compared the diets in communities where oil palm plantations were and in communities where they weren't and the, the nutrition um, metrics were much better in the area where they were still eating traditional foods than in places where they were near the plantations because it was mostly buying processed foods. Yeah, I mean, the other nutritional point is that palm oil is used as an ingredient in what we're now calling ultra processed foods, um, which is the fancy term for a special category of junk foods that um, is now very, very closely linked to over consuming calories, becoming obese, um, uh, getting at higher risk for type 2 diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. And um, an anthropologist, Emily Yates store, some years ago, wrote a book about Guatemala and the transition from traditional diets to these processed food diets mm -hmm. um, in, in Guatemala. And you know, this, but I don't remember her saying anything much about palm oil. It was a mm -hmm. pretty recent phenomenon. And then, yeah, this was probably 10 years ago, and a very good book, by the way. But, uh, um, you know, I, and so all of this just sounds awful. I mean, and that, and it is awful. And the, uh, you know, and, and then where does the pandemic fit into this? Um, there was an article, there was a study that just came out that said um, palm oil is a threat to global health. Um, and, and there had actually, there was another study that a guy did out of Yale linking palm oil plantations, oil palm plantations to um, the emergence of Ebola. Not this most recent one in Liberia and Sierra Leone, but previously, I believe in the DRC. Yeah, how, do you, how do you make that connection? Well, because if you, tr if you cut down the tropical rainforest, then, then these animals that are living there are gonna need to go somewhere else. Makes sense. Habitat, mm -hmm. then they're gonna move closer to humans. And they might move, they might be under um, a fruit tree where, where bats are, you know, these, these zoonotic, sorry, the, uh, these zoonotic diseases that pass from animals to humans. So the more you're going to bring these animals in contact with humans and with, uh, with animals like bats that can transfer between them. So anyway, this, this study about palm oil and the DRC, I wasn't, wasn't quite sure if it, it didn't feel, um, I mean, it was like the, the hypothesis was that this was a, the situation, but I didn't, I didn't feel like I could make it as a definite claim. That's why I didn't put it in the book. But this recent study that I just saw came out last week and it just talked about if you, try, if you try, 
cut down tropical rainforest, then all these animals that have their habitat there are going to need to find, you know, need to move to different places. And that's going to push them closer to humans uh, with carrying the, carrying whatever viruses they might be carrying. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I mean, you paint a really dismal picture of this. Um, and the, um, well, you know, I mean, just the environmental implications, the labor implications, the nutritional implications, the political implications. Um, but in the course of your investigating, it, you ran across people who you thought were doing very good work. Um, and you want to tell us something about, you know, who's who's dealing with this, who's trying to make the situation better? Um, do they have any power? Are they making any progress? What's going on with that? I think they are. And yeah, there are a bunch of organizations. And what I what I loved about it, I mentioned at the beginning that I sort of was in touch with these NGOs at the beginning of my reporting, but they all work really closely with the folks in these villages and in places like Jakarta and Guatemala City. Um, so it's really the, the folks on the ground, ground who are organizing. I did a, um, a class yesterday actually with a, a group of college students from Pakistan, um, which was kind of great. But one of them asked me, you know, are they, did you encounter all these climate change deniers while you were reporting? Because they said they're, they're sort of dealing with that in Pakistan. And I said, actually, I didn't. I feel like on, in the, all these villages that I was going to, they were seeing it firsthand. You know, they're... Um, this deforestation had called, called, caused landslides and it was really hot when we were in, um, I mentioned that photographer from Jakarta who was, who was terrified. We were on a plantation, he was just sweating. And he, he said, I just can't believe how hot it is here. And he's like, I'm from Jakarta, I'm used to hot weather, but still, it's just this, this monoculture. There's like no movement, there's no, um, so they're also feeling it in their everyday lives. Um, so they tend to be very, um, there's a lot of organizing going on in communities around the world. Um, and then, as I said, folks like the Rainforest Action Network are, are doing amazing work, working with these communities, um, Friends of the Earth, Mighty Earth, um, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch are both, have both been looking at the labor issues for a couple of years. Um, so yeah, I think when, when people ask me sort of what can we do, I would say, you know, Go to the websites of these organizations. They all have like palm oil campaigns that you could so you can read reports, find out what's actually going on, and sort of you know what they're doing about it. Because I do, you know, my point in writing the book was like to let people know that this is all happening and that we're all kind of implicated because we use this stuff, eat this stuff every day. Well, we're complicit. We're complicit. You know, it's more than implicated. We're complicit in it. And that's hard. You know, and I'm thinking, well, is there a role for palm oil? What should the role for palm oil be? And I'm thinking of the situation with cocoa, where a lot of the same issues, not all of them, but a lot of the same issues come up with cocoa plantation. You know, everybody loves chocolate, but a lot of it is um, is collected by child labor. And uh, there are terrible problems with exploitation of communities and all of these kinds of things. I mean, palm oil isn't the only food that come, where these issues arise. Is there a role for palm oil? Should we boycott palm oil? I mean, I don't know. Are you Where are you on all of that? I mean, I think a boycott is not a bad thing in, in part because it lets the industry know that we care about it and that we're here and we're looking at it um, in the same way like divestment and from, you know, apartheid South Africa and divestment from fossil fuels. I mean, obviously we're not gonna get rid of the, the palm oil industry for a long time. There's, those plants are good for like 25 years. Um, but I do think, you know, if we make our voices heard, we can maybe stop a new rainforest from being chopped down for more palm oil. Um, and I also think it can sort of let, let these companies, you know, the consumer facing companies, the sort of PepsiCo's and Unilever's and Nestle's of the world know that we care about this and, and that we want to see more transparency. I mean, they have palm oil policies, but they tend to be a little um, gray and you can't, you know, it, it's very hard to trace where oil palm, where the palm oil fruit was, you know, grown and how it was processed if it in, involved deforestation or human rights um, abuses. But I think if, if we let people know that we care about this, then it can start to bring about some change. And the other thing is, I think, you know, 
legislation. I mean, there was legislation here um, in terms of child labor. And um, recently the US um, Customs and Border outlawed imports of palm oil from two big Malaysian firms because of the, um, the forced labor and child labor allegations. So, you know, I think consumer voices matter. Yeah, I was I was interested in in one one thing that I read in the book. I mean, there was a lot, of, but this one just really struck me because it was your clear statement of what you think needs to happen. And you say what we do need desperately are intact tropical rainforests that can store carbon, house the wildlife whose forced migration leads to disease transmission, and ecosystem, ecosystem collapse, and shelter the genetic richness that we'll require to confront the biological challenges of the future. I don't know, I just love that that sentence, because it seems to me, it says so much about what everybody should be advocating for. Um, and I don't know, you, you, you think we all should be advocating for this? I mean, it's such a difficult time in human history. I mean, here we are in the middle of climate change. We're in the middle of um, late stage capitalism. We're in the you know, economic systems that are dividing people and making things more inequitable. And then in the middle of this, you pour on palm oil, <laughs> you know, which, which sounds which sounds like something so small, but what you make clear in this book is that it's attached to every single one of these major issues. It's attached to inequality. It's attached to climate change. Um, it's attached it's attached to poverty. It's attached to um, the big public health program problems, which are not having enough food on the one hand and having too much food on the other. And it's attached to the environmental problems. I mean, it's right there in the middle of it, all of the big public health problems that everybody's facing right now. But the good news is that I think, I think, I mean, partly because of the pandemic and partly because of the climate emergency that, that the world is realizing, like, this is absolutely urgent. We need to start paying attention to these things. Um, so there is a, um, a biodiversity conference coming up in China in October, I think. And then there's a the big climate change conference in, in Glasgow in November. And I mean, I just feel like the, the dire situation we're in and the fact that a lot of communities now that maybe weren't feeling climate change issues firsthand before are with all, all the, the floods and the fires. And I don't know, my hope is that we get it together in time. Uh, well, yeah, well, you know, do you want to add anything? Because I think we should probably turn this over to um, the audience for questions. And so you have anything you want to get in there before we get into whatever it is they're, they're interested in? No, I think I'm good. Well, let's hear what they have to say. All right, let me see if I can read them. Um, how do you, oh, here's a good one. How do you remove palm oil from, from your life? Uh, it's really hard. Well, the main thing you could do is just avoid processed foods because, you know, that's where you're going to find it everywhere. Um, personal care products, it's really hard, but personal care products account for about 7% of palm oil. So, um, I should know the exact brands that don't use any, but um, I don't. But you can you could do that research and and you know write to the brands. The most of them are going to be probably small brands. There actually is a company called Natural Habitats that produces um, organic palm oil and from from Ecuador, and they do it through agroforestry systems. Um, I actually went down and visited them and was really impressed. I think it's a great operation, and they have a campaign called Palm Done Right. I think they have palmdoneright.org. Um, the problem is it's very small at the moment, but you know, maybe if people start uh, caring about it, then that's something that, that could grow, and, and as well as the natural habitats, the, the palm oil that they're producing, but it's a small amount at the moment. Yeah, we don't have very many questions, so there should be plenty of time for answering them. If you have any questions, just type them into the Q&A um, and we'll try to deal with them. Um, here's one that uh, that I, th you know, that's you've sort of touched on, but I think it it puts it in a very different way. Um, Colin Grant asks, who is perpetrating 
uh, the palm oil production and who benefits from this? How would you categorize that? Um, well, there, there are a lot of very rich people in, um, actually it's not that many, I guess, but there are a handful of very, very rich people in Indonesia, a lot of whom were sort of um, Suharto cronies that got these concessions um, way back when. And so they're, they're certainly benefiting, benefiting from the industry. And there are a lot of politicians in Indonesia in particular, it's, it's very bound up with um, local politics. So Indonesia, you know, it's this archipelago of something like 17,000 islands. And um, I think it was around 2000, I may be wrong on the date, but they decentralized the government so that these, these local folks were, these district um, politicians were in charge of land concessions. And so it's gotten very corrupt in terms of you, we, um, we pay you for the election to, we pay you to get elected. And then once you're elected, you give us the, the land concessions. So um, there, are, there are certainly folks on that end and in, in Malaysia as well, it tends to be corrupt. Um, and then, as I said, the, the big agribusiness that are, um, I, I, I don't think Cargill is, um, has clean hands on this front. I mean, there's Cargill, ADM, the Wilmar, the traders of, of palm oil certainly are making a lot of money off the industry. Yeah, I always thought that Unilever was one of the more uh, ethical food companies for big food. Um, you know, they they talk a very ethical game. Um, so so it's, that's kind of interesting. The um, uh, somebody asks, are uh, do we grow palm oil in the United States? It's too cold, so it grows best at um, ten degrees to the north and south of the equator. And this is the problem: the palm oil industry really likes to say, "Oh." It's, it's such a productive crop and this is why we needed to feed the world um, and, and all these other crops take up so much more land, which is partly true, but all these other crops don't have to grow at 10 degrees to the north and south of the equator, which is exactly where the tropical rainforests are and where much of the peatland is and where all this biodiversity is. Also, um, palm oil doesn't give you, uh, you get a little bit of protein meal out of the kernel after, after they've taken the oil out, but um, so that, that sort of excuse that palm oil gives you so much more oil isn't really, it's kind of apples and oranges when you're comparing it to say soy because you're getting all that so, soy protein out of the soy crop as well. Yeah, I, somebody asked a question right on that. Um, palm oil has excellent yield per square meter. What crop could reasonably replace it um, given its widespread use and how would you manage the new crop if it's got a lower yield? Oh, this sounds like the organic question, doesn't it? <laughs> sounds a lot like that. Yeah, anyway, you got an answer for that? Part, part of it is we don't need all this oil. We don't need all this oil in our diet. We never had it and it's, it's bullshit that, you know, suddenly we have to have all this oil to feed the world. This is not the, these are not the calories that the world needs. Um, yeah, I mean, if it's going into ultra processed foods, ultra processed foods are a specific category of junk food that um, is industrially produced, contains ingredients that you can't buy at the supermarket and you don't have in home kitchens, um, that have a lot of additives of various kinds and ingredients that are added, added fat, sugar, salt, and so forth. So you, these are exactly the foods that people should be avoiding. Uh, figure out which ones are ultra processed and avoid them. That means you're gonna be automatically avoiding palm oil as well as a lot of other things. Um, and because it's so cheap, it's a great filler for the, and, and once it's been processed, it's basically tasteless and odorless. And that's why it's a great filler for all these junk yeah. foods. That's why everybody loves it. Um, somebody's asking, are international development organizations like the World Bank and others um, aware of the problem and are they doing anything about it? We have any Actually, policies going on? Um, yeah, well, the, the, the World Bank for a while in the mid, 2000, I think around 2000, it actually cut off um, funding for palm oil altogether because there were there were so many problems with the industry with like land grab conflicts and um, environmental conflicts. They, they now fund some palm oil projects. But in 2019, the World Health Organization released a report. I mentioned it in the book, Mary, and I don't know if you remember, comparing, comparing the palm oil to the, um, to the tobacco and alcohol industries in terms of their sort of... Um, you know, paying for paying for um, 
researchers to put out reports that say, oh no, this is, this is really good for you. Um, and in terms of the, the fact that it's in all these processed foods and, and you're gonna get sort of a cocktail effect, not only is it 50% saturated fats, but it's in all these processed foods. Um, so it was warning, one against the dangers of palm oil and also sort of warning people about the sort of sleazy politics that were going on, sleazy PR that was going on in the industry um, and sort of not to believe a lot of what is what was being touted by the palm oil lobby. I don't know how many people read that report, but. Probably not nearly as many as should have. Um, uh, here's someone who's thanking you for the book and is, thinks it's really important, wants to know what to do about it. And what, what's your hope for what the impact of the book will be? That's a really good one. Yeah, um, as I said, just um, awareness. You know, you were astonished. I was astonished when I started reporting this. I think Americans in particular just don't know when people said, what are you working on? I'd say a book about palm oil. They'd say about what? What's that? <laughs> I think um, in Europe, they're a lot more um, aware. Also in Australia and New Zealand, there's sort of a lot of stuff about palm oil because they, they're so close to um, the industry in Southeast Asia. But so awareness, as I said, if people could go to the websites of those different organizations that are like, you know, really focused on this issue and working with the local communities. I mean, I get reports, there was a report I just got, or it was a, um, an article that I just read like three days ago about this enormous plantation that they're starting, oil palm plantation that they're about to establish in Cameroon. Um, you know, again, cutting down the tropical rainforest and they had interviewed villagers and they said, we do not want this, it's gonna pollute our rivers. The, the rainforest is where we get our food, it's where we get our medicines, it's where we get our building materials. So it's still happening all over the place. Um, and so to, to make people aware and sort of give voice to these communities that are living it on the front lines. Yeah, we're getting lots of questions about what can individuals do. It's a, it's a hard one because as I said, it is hard to cut it out of your out of your sort of daily life, um, mainly in, in, but if you're avoiding processed foods, that's gonna go a long way. But I would say get involved in campaigns. Um, and there was a, um, Brian Schatz, a Democrat of Hawaii announced a couple of weeks ago that he's about to introduce legislation tied to um, products coming into the states that are tied to deforestation. I think there might be a human rights component to that as well. And there's simil similar legislation that was just introduced in the EU and the UK, I believe. So I feel like these issues are starting to bubble up. I mentioned that the, um, we have banned imports from two Malaysian palm oil companies. So I think, you know, make, make your voices heard, let people know that this is an issue that you care about. Um, and that's how, how things could change. The other thing I'll say is like, um, I recently did this interview with a YouTuber, um, Adam Ragusea, people might know him, he's amazing. It already has almost 400,000 views. Uh, <laughs> called WTF is palm oil. And there are a lot of questions. So apparently he's got this global audience. Um, if you watch it, you'll see he's, he's a real genius, but there were a lot of comments from sort of Malaysia, Indonesia saying, you know, who is this Western woman saying that our crop is so bad? And, you know, this is so many livelihoods depend on this. So part of my argument is also like, yeah, we, we, as you said, we're complicit and we've got a lot of money that I think that, you know, the countries have to support um, countries that are home to tropical rainforests and peatlands to keep those rainforests sort of standing and to keep that peat in the ground. Um, you know, we can't just expect them to do it themselves and also to transition away from monoculture crops like oil palm. Um, here's another one. How do you feel about some of the companies that are working on palm oil alternatives? Um, like C21 Biosciences, I don't know what that is, um, but what are the alternatives? I, I really don't know anything about this. Um, they're, they're working on, um, yeah, synthetic palm oil. So there's, uh, there's one I mentioned in the book is Xylem. They're based in um, Wisconsin. They're um, sort of uh, using a fermentation process with yeast to produce it. And um, they already have a product in, in small amounts and they've got a grant from the energy department. They also wanna make um, biofuels. No, they don't wanna make biofuels. Sorry, they wanna make um, 
palm oil using the corn stover from that is left over at ethanol plants. And then the C D16 biosciences. Um, they're a, a New York City based company for startup. I think it's about two years old from some folks out of MIT. And they are also making um, synthetic palm oil. They got, I think, $10 million, $20 million from um, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, the, the outfit founded by um, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. And um, there's also some uh, research happening at, uh, at Bath um, University, a university in Bath that um, is working to make synthetic palm oil. So I'm all for it. I think um, if we can get, you know, the amount that we need, again, I don't think we need the amount we have now for garbage foods, but if we can get the amount we need without um, chopping down more tropical rainforest and restoring what we've lost, then I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking this is really simple. Um, you know, if you eat a healthy diet, you're not gonna be eating palm oil because you're not gonna be eating the products that it's in. And healthy diets are really easy. I'm mean, gonna always quote Michael Pollan's, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And he doesn't mean palm trees, <laughs> he doesn't. Um, you know, by food, he's talking about thing, foods that are not what are, we're calling ultra processed, which are these heavily industrialized products. And we, we now have all this evidence, even from controlled clinical trials, that ultra processed foods cause people to eat more than they ordinarily would. 500 calories a day more in the experiment that was done at NIH. Uh, and so dietary advice has become very, very simple. Don't eat a lot of ultra processed foods. And this would, if you did that, you wouldn't be eating most of the, of the products that are, that contain palm oil. I don't know what to say about makeup. <laughs> you know, that's another matter, but there surely are other ways. Right, but as you said at the beginning, it's a much bigger systemic issue because then people will talk about what if you don't know how to cook, you know, you're working two jobs. You or you're poor, right, oh, right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's an elitist, it's an elitist dietary advising, right, I know that. Um, but still, you know, whole foods are healthier for everybody. Traditional diets are healthier than diets that are based on industrialized foods. And this seems to me this fits right into that argument. I agree. You know, in, in a lot of ways. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, but maybe that's because. Uh, great presentation. Thanks, it says. <laughs> <laughs> the, the last one. I would agree. Thank yeah. you, Jocelyn, for doing this. And I see that uh, Politics and Prose is back. So I'll turn it back over to Julia. Um we do have um, one bonus question from Politics and Prose. I did just want to ask a personal question here too. Um, Jocelyn, um, from the role of reporting, it does seem like um, it's easier to get some interest on the consumer level when we talk about how unhealthy it is to eat these things in our diets. Um, and it's sort of harder to get people to click into something that um, reveals something across seas or something that feels detached from our own bodies. Um, do you think, do you think it's um, good for a reporter to sort of get the lead in with how unhealthy an ingredient can be and then sort of um, bring in the global aspect, or do you think it should be more on consumers to really look into um, the sort of macro and ethical um, ethical aspects of what we're consuming? Um, I, I think you're right that that is certainly sort of Americans seem to care more about things when it has to do with their own bodies, which um, I think is a little unfortunate. I, I would argue that, you know, climate change and biodiversity are um, as important, but, um, so I think that's changing. I think maybe with the pandemic that's changing, right? That we're all realizing that all these things are connected. So um, to me, as I said, the, the sort of global implications, the human rights issues hit me a little bit harder, which was why I, I'm, I didn't make it so much just like a, a food, you know, a health nutrition um, angled book. So I don't know. I hope it will appeal to enough people. I may have gone at it the wrong way. But. It appealed to me. <laughs> And me too. I think it certainly does. And I 
I really do agree that um, the pandemic has really brought those things um, out of the woodwork for sure. Um, and then our bonus question from Politics and Prose is, in addition to Planet Palm, which we should all go and get right away, um, is there anything on your bedside table or what you're currently reading in your own life that you'd like to suggest or plug for our audience? Fiction, nonfiction, whatever you'd like. You asked, because I actually brought this book down. I just figured, finished this yesterday. I don't know if people have heard this book, How Beautiful We Were. Mm -hmm. It is, not only is it such a beautiful book, it's so beautifully written. Um, it takes place in Cameroon and it's all about um, how an oil company came to this village and basically despoiled the soil and the river and the, how it impacted the villagers. And reading it, I was like, this, this sounds like everything that all the villagers across the world told me about palm oil country, companies. So it's so similar. And the fact that it's oil, you know, in one form or another, but so I recommend that. Absolutely. I, I really, really loved it. Marion, do you have a suggestion for the audience too? Well, I review a book on my website, foodpolitics.com, pretty much every Friday. Uh, Jocelyn, I posted your book last Friday. Um, and this coming Friday, I'm going to be doing Peter Hoffman's new memoir. Um, about uh, he ran a restaurant. He ran a restaurant in um, New York City called Savoy, and he's um, that he had to close. And uh, the book is a memoir about his um, the rise and fall of the Savoy and how he got involved in it. And it's sort of a book about food ingredients. Palm oil is not one of them. <laughs> Well, thank you both. Um, please do check out our website as well as Marion's um, for all of those titles and to get them through us at Politics and Prose. Um, we really do want to thank both Jocelyn C. Zuckerman and Marion Nessel for being with us this evening and our audience out there for tuning in and engaging with your very thoughtful questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you these types of live events and we couldn't do it without the book sales to support them. So go ahead and follow the link in the chat to purchase your copy of Planet Palm, How Palm Oil Ended Up in Everything and Endangered the World directly from us, or you can visit politics-pros.com. And while you're there, feel free to check out our events calendar for everything else coming up in June and beyond. And from our shelves to yours, we hope you're out there staying safe, staying strong, and of course, staying well-read. And we will see you next time. Thanks so much, Marion. Thanks so much, Jocelyn. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Marion. Nice to see everyone.